Day one in, in North Wares and Lem Bears, we came up to the Jerry's Roof area and Johnny Dawes was there and it was the first time I'd ever met him before. It was really classic because I'd always wanted to meet him. I wasn't sure like if it was if it was was Johnny at first, because like I didn't really know and then, and then I just was like, oh shit, that's Johnny Dawes. Like, alright, like it was like <laughs> From then on, like I think we climbed with them almost almost every day. <laughs> that was what should have been called Johnny's roof. <laughs> yeah. That's what Johnny told me at least. The Slate Quarries is a really, really interesting place. It's got this extremely industrial feel to it because there's all this like old material used to quarry the slate. Some people look at it as this like kind of, you know, ugly to the eye, this like hole in the mountain, but obviously, you know, climbers can find, find beauty in it. She's, I think, one of the most talented female track climbers I've ever seen climb. Like, like I'm supposed to be like a full-time climber, and she's like a 19-year-old girl at uni, and like she's kind of showing me how to do shit. She's really bold. I haven't really seen her get that scared. She tries really hard. She'll go for it. You know, like she's not scared to take a big fall. Like. Scary. I usually can be brave, but I just had all these images of like scraping my face off and like getting all tangled in the rope and then like hitting my head against something. But um, I'm glad that I did it. The slate is so bizarre. It's like you have to like kind of acquaint yourself to it to get used to it. You know, it's like totally different than anything else I've ever climbed on. Everything is super smooth. You cannot smear it, except for there's like, you know, like two little edges here. And that's it. That's all you're given, you know? So because of that, it, it makes the climbing really precise. You, you, you can't like, like kick your way up things. Like you have to like be really, really exact and precise on the climbing. Gym Palace is really hard to describe because it's not really a chimney, it's not really a corner, it's not really a groove. But it's just the most bizarre movement because you're just using everything to get you up this like open book kind of like corner thing. <laughs> It's like you're underclinging and then you have to like shove your like hip in the wall and like eventually like you're just chimneying it but it's not big enough to like really chimney so you're like just like putting your knees against the wall. It's a style of climbing that I kind of save for only when I have to do like I'm not the kind of person that likes to like suffer up roots like that. 
And then it's not all over once you come out of the groove because you have to get into these hand jams and then you go into these finger locks and all of a sudden you're on this like steep sort of roof move. And then you're like finger crack climbing like a couple moves, which is like, I love finger cracks. It's kind of like, kind of like my specialty maybe. He's just a, he's a, like, he's a character, like, he is a real, yeah. real character. He, like, he looks at you and he, like, tries to figure you out, but at the same time, you, you can't really try to figure Johnny out. For some reason, like me, Johnny, and Hazel all had this like really cool like vibe together. Like it felt really like natural and just like oh, prancing around with Johnny. Like <laughs> Johnny, you're up. Go, Johnny, go, 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 Johnny, go. <laughs> it's been really, really funny. It's kind of made my trip in a lot of ways. It's not a good sign that I feel grumpy on that voice start, is it? Come on, Johnny. Come on, Johnny. Go on. Nice, Johnny, come on. Nice, Johnny. 
on, hey, come on. Tell me about Clyde when we met. He's all right for an American, I suppose. Um, uh, he listens to cheesy hip hop. <laughs> <laughs> He's not a completely stereotypical American climber because he doesn't just climb on granite, he doesn't just crack climb. He also isn't just a sport climber either. You know, he's good at bouldering, sport climbing and traditional climbing. <laughs> After that, I just felt like someone like punched me like a gazillion times on like all my sides and my abs were sore and my biceps were sore and like my knees were bloody and like, you know, like I got cut like in the inside because you're just using everything to get you up this like, I don't know, like 20 foot like little like open book kind of like corner thing. So this will be your first E6 lead, is that correct? That's my first E6, aye, yep. 
Uh, what, what's, your, what's your current ambition then? Uh, E7. <laughs> <laughs> My actual current ambition is to actually make it here in the night, walking. Sacrifice my brain cells it till two. I used to wonder who stole my money, swapped my friends for zombies, kicked around my shoes. Now I've stepped outside the glass and I see past you. Now I'm on the edge of the hood and I see past you. <laughs> oh man, that's a good route. See, they see me kind of messing about with my feet quite a lot. Yeah. Really oh, difficult oh. getting in there. I try to switch horns on that tiny wee crimp because I've got to go for like catching it with that bit of my finger to then switching it to that side. That's what it is. catching this and then get that enough there, put my feet moving and then it's that massive reach to catch that. So you never bought me a bug cage, man. You know, most climbers are into climbing, I, th I think, primarily for the movement on the rock, you know. And if you've got normal four healthy limbs, then, you know, we're, our bodies are really well geared up for moving on rock and it's, it's so enjoyable, you know, it's fluid, it's actually a nice thing to do. But for Kev, it must be really frustrating because you just don't have that, that flowing sequence of hand movements. If you're trying to climb at your limit all the time, particularly with the disability on my hand, it can be really, really frustrating. But I could turn up at a route one day, go in my shunt or be second in or whatever, and there'll be a move that I just can't do at all because of my hand. And doing that causes so much frustration. It's like there's so much that I'd really like to be able to do, but there's just one simple move on a route that I kind of didn't. It might not even be the crux of a route, but I just simply can't kind of do that move. And that that's probably the worst thing, I think, about climbing. Once I actually find a route no. that suits and it's near my limits and I feel happy that that's what I want to try, actually get it done. And then there's this, this bloody great feeling of having done something that you really, really wanted to do. You've survived it. It's magic and then within an hour you're thinking, all right, what's next? And then you go and try something else and it's straight back to the frustration. Oh God, I can't do that. I need to try and find something else. And it's just this constant cycle of doing that. Oh, you're worth it. But it's, it's worth all that. Anger, misery, stress, everything else that goes with just for that bit at the end of actually getting a route done. Everything's worth it. You always strike me that you always seem very confident 
in your uh, ability that if you can do it you know, on a top rope, then you can do it on the lead or on the solo. Oh, I think that's the that's part of the whole challenge of the thing is to be as in control when you don't have a rope as, as when you do have a rope. I don't see the point in top roping something that I'm never going to either solo or, or do on lead. So you've got to have that confidence because if you don't have that then well, you're going to fall. It's as simple as that because you're going to shake or sweat that wee bit too much or make a mistake on the move, is there anything? So you're saying you, you, you just believe you've got to do it? Oh I definitely, I. But if there was any doubt, I just... Well, obviously, there like, might be a wee bit of doubt, but again, you've still got to, still got to do it. You can't like, stop doing things because there might be a bit of fear of falling or anything like that. You know, I love climbing and soloing and stuff too much to, to stop just because I'm fear of getting killed or badly hurt or whatever. And it's the, the consequences being real that makes it satisfying and that makes it more intense, you know? It's the fact that you will fall and smash into boulders and die. <laughs> as gruesome as that sounds, that's what makes it so powerful. If you didn't have that, it wouldn't be quite the same. We're climbing. For me personally, it's really cathartic and like depression and stuff that I suffered way with connected with my epilepsy and my hand and stuff like that. It allows me to escape through all that kind of thing. Climbing and solo and which is it's such a positive experience for me. I kind of take antidepressants because of my epilepsy. But yeah, it's epilepsy that causes my depression, so there's quite a kind of weird thing there, I suppose. But I with the climbing, it's been such a great coping me mechanism, I think, for, for coping with depression and for coping with my disability, because I can see what's been possible, regardless of, like, <laughs> since I was a kid, I've been told what I was never be capable of doing, or you can't do this, you can't do that. But I've been told for years and years that you can't do anything, basically, and then you discover something like climbing, and there's no actual limits there, it's, the only limits is what you put in yourself, so you can go there and just keep pushing and pushing and pushing and just try to find these new things. It's just fantastic. It makes you see clearly uh, where you've been placing limitations on yourself. And when you see someone else that has an obvious big limitation that they can't help, but they've just like, brush that aside and not let it get in the way of what they want to do, then it just makes you see like, oh yeah, it can be done. Because like, so often I think people place limits on themselves and say, I can't do that, do this for this reason. Like, but then you see someone who is starting literally with a handicap and has gone beyond that. And you see, no, that's just a limitation I've placed on myself. Oh, not exactly graceful at the top, but... Oh, that was absolutely bloody brilliant. Just really sketchy, like that. <laughs> oh man, that is a good route. Great rock to climb on. I'm really chuffed with that. I'm so glad I didn't test my gear. I mean, I've been really fortunate in the folk that I climb with are really positive, really helpful and they like some of my winter climbing, uh, getting my prosthetics made by the University of Strathclyde. I mean, without the folk I wouldn't be able to have done more than half the things that I've already done. Find new ways to get your kicks To chill to men to learn new tricks Now I've stepped outside the glass And I see past this Now I'm on the edge of the hood And I see 
past this. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah, uh, excellent penetration uh, with that. Uh, Cycles of these days I don't want to share this price you pay Now I've stepped outside the glass And oh, you yeah, still man. see me Now I'm on the edge of the hood Can you still see me? Oh. I knew that Kev had done this route and it, and it suited him really well because he had the prosthetic ice axe so it could remove his disability to a certain extent and allow him to have that nice fluid movement of climbing. But then I, I'd heard that he was interested in soloing it and I thought, oh yeah, that would be quite something. But you know, you hear about these ideas all the time of people that they're going to try this or that and didn't really think much of it until I heard that he had soloed it. The general reaction was pretty much always the same of crazy, stupid. That seems to have been the kind of general, <laughs> general reaction I've had for, for everybody. Then I just thought, oh my God, like, you know, every time I think about it, it just, just gives you the shivers down your spine because it's like, that'd be terrifying. In rock climbing, when, you, when you're about to fall, you, you feel your strength going, you get feedback from your fingers. But with dry tooling, you, you're just climbing and you feel fine, but then your tool just goes and pops out. Like you're hanging on the rope before you even know what's going on. I think because it, with the rock being quite friable as well, it's, there is to a certain extent, there's, this, there's something out with your control that that might break. And, you're coming off. If you come off that roof high up, you're going to be in a pretty damn bad way. <laughs> I think there's been like maybe one thing in my life that I can focus on um, that'll probably make me push myself harder than, than anything else. I'd, I'd maybe put an image of that into my head just quickly and then it's enough to, to give me that extra jolt of adrenaline or just that extra thing that I need to, to make me take that bit made extra risk. It's like most other hard ascents, I'm like, yeah, like, he could probably do that if he really, really pulled out the stops and he could probably do that. But the soloing Fast and Furious, no one else could do that. I don't know any other climber that would, that would do that, you know? <laughs> That's, it's not very often you get that. Ooh. But I think about the one time I think it was probably kind of pretty serious about Alassie and at least you kind of gave me the choice between her and climbing to a certain extent and I chose climbing like and I don't regret that choice but I did kind of to a certain extent I suppose missed having her in my life but every time that I'm standing at the bottom of a solo or anything like that I always think Right, well, I've sacrificed that one thing that meant that much to me in my life to be here. So I have to actually do this route. I have to be taking these risks because I have to justify that choice that I made back then. So I think every single time I'm doing something that's, that's dangerous or way beyond my limit or there's a potential that I'm, I'm not coming back for something, then I always use that to... <laughs> They kind of really focus me in. Oh, fucking fuck! Because I think, well, if I've sacrificed that, then fuck! I kind of go back to that that part of my life. So I've got to really focus on on this part. Oh, it's just never possible. Fucking fuck! Who the fuck are you? Fuck! 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 Ah! <sighs> oh, fuck! 
Fuck it! No, it's just never gonna work, guys. Laura's doing what? Fuck! Well, when I started climbing at first because of my hand and my epilepsy, I, I really struggled to find anybody that wanted to climb with me, which is, I suppose is quite understandable. It's like, well, there's a guy with one horn and he's epileptic, and I think we'll give him a bit of a wide berth. So it was like a, a really natural thing for me to start getting into solo, and I kind of really found that I enjoyed solo. I mean, a lot of the rock gear, like protection and stuff that I've bought at the beginning of my climbing career, I've still got to start at least surprisingly new. Yeah, I think I'm pretty close to my absolute limit of what I'm capable of on. Yeah, like my actual physical limit. So that done ramps it right up and takes you pretty damn close to your mental limit as well when you're doing something that the limit of what you're probably capable of. That is so good, man. <laughs> oh. oh, thank God for that, man. Oh, it's just so bloody... There isn't any words for that, actually. Just doesn't get any better than that feeling. Oh, so happy now for another day or two. 
Now I see that I've a chance So oh, I can't talk and I can't dance Break the cycles of these days I don't want to share this price you pay Now I've stepped outside the glass Can you still see? I guess we went to Madagascar ma mainly because we saw that there was some amazing 800 meter walls. They looked like really pristine granite and the country looked like an amazing country. Taranaro, the area where we were climbing, is I, th I think one of the most unique and, and unusual big walling destinations anywhere in the world. Madagascar it itself is a, a completely unique island. 4% of the world's total plant and animal species are found in Madagascar. Um, what's truly extraordinary is 80% of that 4% are endemic, so they don't occur anywhere else. I went out with Fat Boy, who is a living legend. James McAfee, the Dirty Cumbrian, as he is called, he's just far too good at climbing for his own good. Dave Pickford, who is um, the climbing journalist, never without a camera, and, uh, and myself. A lot to be said for like minimalistic topos and not really knowing what you're doing and it's, it's kind of quite fun. <laughs> Madagascan granite is um... Yeah, it's extremely, it's extremely unusual rock, and it's, predominant, it's predominantly um, very compact, um, quite smooth, uh, technical face climbing. There's very, very little in the way of, of extremely steep or overhanging rock there. The crux pitch is like this fantastic crack that leads out to an arete and then like a, almost like a gritstone boulder problem about 200 metres off the floor. Madagascan granite is um, extremely hard, very fine-grained granite, um, and it's um, it's quite unusual in the sense that although it's um, 
I mean, obviously granite is by its nature often extremely hard. Um, it's also got a, a lot of um, surface friability, so it can be um, uh, particularly the, the, the stuff that hasn't been climbed before. Um, it can be uh, actually quite alarmingly, can feel quite alarmingly loose. It's like little big walling in Madagascar, you know, like the routes you can definitely do in a day, um, which is great. Once you have to start hauling loads of gear with you, it slows you down, it's much harder work, but the biggest wall in Madagascar is about 800 metres, I think. The best reason I've ever done that. Well, yeah, yellow fever came about uh, really by default as much as by design, which is perhaps some of the sometimes the best new routes um, are created in the, in that in that style. It takes this very striking and really aesthetic um, yellow streak in the, in the otherwise dark grey and black granite on the right hand side of, of Lima Wall. Here's my selection of skyhooks. Yeah, well, I've never done any uh, aid climbing before. I have placed a few skyhooks on routes in Britain, but I've never actually put any weight on them. Did, it, did any of them fall out, Jack? Uh, <laughs> I can't actually remember. Yeah. Well, we uh, better see what happens. Yeah, OK. Let's get on with it. Nice. Good effort. <laughs> 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 the right hand side of it, James, not, not the sharp left hand bit, but the right hand bit is better. All right, yeah, I like that, and pull, and you can pull into it a bit. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, yeah, right foot on that, that broken, no, no, further in, I, I, that, that one, yeah. Left heel on, yeah, yeah. yeah. We spent a while trying to trying to red point it, but it actually turned out that uh, both due to the, the hot conditions and also the extremely fingery and, and difficult nature of the climbing meant that we, not, we, we realized quickly, fairly quickly, that it wasn't gonna, we weren't going to be able to free climb it. We thought we weren't going to be able to free the route. We thought it was going to have an aid pitch, which would have been rubbish. But then Dave came up with this genius idea of traversing off to the right about 20 meters and climbing up this hanging vine. Seems to be good, Jack. Just watch this, okay? I'm watching you. It seemed to be the obvious way of, of, of ascending this, this otherwise fairly, uh, fairly problematic looking chimney. So. <clears throat> it was one of, one of the more exciting climbing moments of the entire trip for me. Um, you can imagine hanging onto a vine that you, you don't know exactly what it's growing out of or, or, or indeed attached to. Um, and setting off sort of Tarzan style, hand over handing up this vine. And, it, and Dave climbed that on site, Tarzan style up the vine. Um, he loved it really, he likes that sort of stuff. The ring-tailed lemurs are, ex are extraordinary creatures. Lemurs themselves, are, they're not found anywhere else in the world except Madagascar. They're actually a, a species of primate, uh, but they broke off from the main primate 
group. They're extraordinary creatures. They're almost like a, a kind of combination of a cat and a, and a, and a, and a monkey. They've got this very feline uh, movement, which is it's really extraordinary. They're, they're also very sort of mischievous and, and playful. The ring-tailed lemurs, the ones that are most common in Andranquitra, and they're all over the, the base of the, the base of the cliffs, uh, particularly where we were um, where we were climbing on Lemur Wall. The wall is named after these these creatures that populate the base of it, uh, and they're, they're, you can you can hear them, um, you know, chattering in the in the undergrowth when you're climbing. It's really uh, really extraordinary. Are you tough enough? All right. Well, yeah, this is an amazing climb. Um, the world's hardest big wall free climb to date. I reckon he wants to do the whole thing now, doesn't he, probably? Yeah. He does. He, says, he said to me, oh, I just want to try the bottom half and maybe, you know, it'd be an achievement to free that bottom pitch. I was like, yeah, cool. And then he said, later on. Yeah. And then I just want to try the top half <laughs> and try and free the top half. I said, so that means that you're going to try the entire route then? Uh, well, I guess you could put it that way. It's an amazing wall. It's um, about 500 metres high, completely blank, with basically no features, which is quite unique for a wall of that size. You know, it's not like Yosemite where you've got great big ledges and corners and flake systems. All the pitches are very similar in style, just slightly less than vertical, but it feels vertical when you're on them and um, very crimpy. James being obviously one of the UK's most talented climbers at this style of you know, extremely technical um, face climbing was really you know, drawn by these, um, these unclimbed uh, art, uh, pitches on the headwall that hadn't, hadn't been previously free climbed, they'd only been climbed on aid. Once you start falling off, I think that's when you start to become not worried. Yeah. And the thing is, you're going to fall off somewhere on, on the, a route like this, you know, it's not unsightable. Oh, that felt harder on the lead. So the challenge, the challenge is the fact that you might not be able to do tough enough. Exactly. Well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's really rare to get a, uh, a, a route of that length that is that hard up from the start to the finish. There's basically no easy pitches on Tuffin now. Yeah, go on, Cap. Go on. Yeah. Hopefully, won't be too bad. Cheers. Nice, well, 
Oh. Yeah, hard as well. It was, it was great, great climbing. Uh, really big pitch. It's, it's a line as in the sense that it's a line of blankness. Uh, you need to be like a gecko to, to climb this thing, literally stick to the rock. Very fingery, very on-off, powerful, kind of, um, you know, tour burning climbing. <laughs> He never seems to put a foot wrong or a hand wrong. Like every 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 move he makes seems to be, you know, even if he's climbing on site, seems to be, you know, absolutely accurate to the it gives you gives you the, this uncanny impression that he's been on the route before, but actually he hasn't. He's just got this kind of natural, just am amazing natural climbing instinct. We had this um, French magazine article from Grimper magazine and it had all pitch grades like 8C question mark, 8C plus question mark. It just looked amazing. From conception to completion, it's taken something like 20 climbers from, from more than 10 countries um, over three years to complete. So it's quite an extraordinary story really. Um, Some of the pitches that James freed would be like remarkable standard, you know, single pitch climbs on, the, on their own. And James had a look at the other pitches and, and did all the moves and if we'd have had more time, you know, surely could have done those as well. Fucking hell. Well done James, good effort. Oh, awesome. And top moves are hard as well. What have we got there, James? We've got a bottle of three horses beer, the Madagascan special. That is fucking hell. That's a mighty fine beer. Yeah, uh, you've earned it. The bullet heads with Eurasian eyes. We got freeway right here, which is one of my favorite all-time routes. Probably one of the best routes in the world of all the places I've been to. You can do anything. You can hike for days. You can go into the Alpine pretty quick. Like above us, you can't really see it when we're down in this valley, but up above us, it's like huge Alpine terrain. For me, 
me, the rope is really sort of the, uh, I mean, if you think about it, it's the life force, it's the energy, it's the, uh, it's, it's where the safety comes from, it's, it's where my, you know, it's what ties me to the climber and the climber to me, and that's our real, that's our bond, you know, that's our, that's our energetic connection right there, and, uh, you know, for me to play such a vital role in that is, um, it's pretty special, you know, I've always, it's what I've aspired to do for a long time, and now I finally feel like, you know, at this point in my career, I can honestly say that I've achieved, I've accomplished everything that I've looked to do. Something about that nylon infused with tiny, tiny, tiny shards of aluminum. It's a special, it's a special bond between me and the rope, and the rope and the the climber and but mostly between me and the rope I mean the first time I climbed Presto was probably five years ago. I remember looking down at this thing as I was getting lowered off, I was cleaning my draws, and there was just this really thin seam. And, um, you know, I started talking about it with a couple buddies, and my friend Patrick, he was on the same wavelength I was, you know, right away. He's like, that thing goes on gear. So, yeah, about four or five years later, here I am. I got a number of projects on the go, and they're all going to be pretty hard, but. You know, in this heat, it's kind of, what are you going to do to keep yourself, you know, you can only go to the lake so many times, you can only get drunk so many times. It's a perfect opportunity to try this line on gear. If you fall from the last moves, you're probably going to hit that flake at the bottom, the very bottom, and possibly, if your belayer is not on it, you're going to probably deck. And that's where the climb gets a little more serious. And that, to me, that's what makes it interesting. You know what, this is just for fun, really. It's just for fun. It's like, I know I can do it on bolts. I know I can top rope it, you know. I don't feel comfortable soloing it. So why not try and just up the ante a little bit? It's a, it's a personal challenge, it's a personal best. And it's kind of a silly party trick, really. You just gotta smedge your way up this thing. It's, there's really no, you know, the, it's not about how strong your fingers are. It's not about, you know, power endurance climbing. It's just about, it's about funkiness and, and, and smedging your way and, and, and kind of balance point too. I mean, as soon as you lose your balance point, you fall off this thing. And the problem is it's 35 degrees today. And, you know, it felt as though my fingers were just like melting off. This last week has just been like an inferno here. And so most people just take the, the week off. I don't I don't know that many people have been climbing this last week. I think it's hotter than I've ever seen it in Squamish, you know, in the last eight years. Dude, what's up with those shorts? You know, the funny thing about these shorts is, actually, well, they're Will Gads, <laughs> believe it or not. I mean, I think he designed these for Red Bull. It's pretty funny. Yeah, they're kind of, they're a little feminine. Well, they're not very flattering to the male figure, to be honest, but, um, yeah, he designed them with extra room for himself. <laughs> You know, it's funny because the heat actually affects your motivation and more than anything because you can't just, you can't get out of the house. You just end up sitting around, the, you know, watching TV and, you know, it's the minute you try and go outside and try and do anything, you know, you get to the, even if you hike to the cliff, 
you know, by the time you get halfway there, usually you're, you're already turning around and going home. Like it's, it's quite debilitating, the heat. It's only 5.30. Still got 30 minutes to get our asses out there and get warmed up. Corey looks like he's ready. Just uh, picking my belay device. You know, I got some choices here. You know. Oh yeah, that's uh, Katie Brown does a gold. Yeah. Good memories. Okay. Yeah, I can't really. Uh, I can't really just wake up and start belaying a hard route right away. It just uh, doesn't work for me. I definitely need to warm up in the morning. You just don't get right off the bat this, this caliber belaying this level, you know? This is my warm up rope. I never really use this for climbing because it's just, uh, it's too special. It's, these ones are more for taking it in, you know, on a run. I call this the Gandhi Triangle. Because I just like to kind of call this the archer. So I really just like to, you know, kind of put it in there and kind of sit down and take some time and just do some basic exercises. Rock and roll.
the thing. <laughs> Woohoo! I don't think I'd want to do that every day. <laughs> but man, it was good. Good job, dude. Well, you know, if you're not, if you're not belaying, you're just climbing. The plan of the day is basically to get into Hell's Lom, get on Firestone, which is my first E7, hopefully, get that soloed, and then get home and have a beer and actually be able to relax for the first time this summer, hopefully. It's a kind of weird one because, like, getting on E7 is like the ultimate goal that I've had in my rock climbing. So if I manage to solo E7, that's where I said I would end my soloing career. But I don't know if I'm actually going to manage to be able to take a step back now and, and stop that song. I'm struggling a wee bit, I think, we this could be the last of the... doing that Ooh. kind of thing. Bollocks, bollocks, bollocks. Take it tight there, front. It's just like one, one or two moves, maybe. Scary. Pretty much all you're doing is stopping me from hitting the deco on this. That's no, it. I uh... It's just pure balance and friction. There is absolutely nothing to hold at all. Leave it there. I've got like, there's a lot of tiny wee just minutes or sloper but it's just enough to get balance on, to mantle up, and then after that, it's just completely blank. Ooh. I don't think the reality's kicked in yet of what I'm about to do because I've just tap roped it, but I think if I did a really slack, Tap rope will start getting me into that mindset that I need to be in to, to go for it. Take it tight front. Fuck it. Same move. Hmm. It's not gonna work. Oh, fucking hell. Can I talk to friends, family? I can't concentrate at work. I can't concentrate on anything at all. Apart from getting E7 done, it's just became a complete and utter. It's not even obsession, it's possession more than anything else. Thank you. 
Oh, yeah, fucking you. Whoa, Jesus. Woo! <laughs> Holy fuck. Fucking hell, man. Really is getting greasy. Oh man, <laughs> that was absolutely bloody amazing. That's been one of the best afternoons I have ever had in my life. I couldn't be happier than than what I am right now. I mean, a solid E7. That's like a lifetime ambition for me. There isn't a word that will describe. I don't think how I feel. I definitely feel at peace, but I can that that feeling will disappear be probably the end of the night. I'll be thinking, what can I do next? What can I do next? Or something stupid like that.